So welcome everybody. I'm Jeff Gedman with American Purpose. We have roughly 30 or maybe 30 or so registered for this session. We didn't want you to wait, you who arrived punctually, but I think colleagues will be joining us in the next two, three, four, five minutes, but here we go. Um, it's my pleasure to welcome and introduce Emily Estelle. She is a research fellow at AEI. She is widely published and has an area of interest which is of, of interest to us for a number of reasons. She tracks jihadist networks around the world, I would say Africa in particular. As I say, she's a gifted scholar and prolific writer. What we'll do as we usually do in these Zoom discussions is we'll keep it participant intensive. I'm gonna begin by asking Emily a number of questions about the subject at hand and about her current work, but that won't take too, too long. We'll do that for 20 minutes or so, and then open it up to the gallery. So first, welcome to everybody. And Emily, thanks for making time. It's great to see you and welcome. Yeah, thank you so much, Jeff, for having me. I'm really excited for the discussion. Uh, my and our pleasure. So, so first thing, Emily, is this. Um, you're a graduate of Dartmouth and you studied anthropology and Arabic. That strikes me as interesting in two ways, maybe obvious to many. I, I think that of the many challenges we have in our foreign policy making community, I, I think it's enormously helpful when we speak languages uh, for the obvious reasons, but it's underappreciated at times for us Americans, if I may say. And then the other is anthropology, because I feel not infrequently, if I may be direct, that we Americans look at problems around the world as engineering problems, things that we can map out and work out and fix on a whiteboard. But, but lo and behold, the countries, nations, and peoples of the world tend to have their own histories, cultures, traditions, and it's often complicated. Can you tell us a little bit about how you got into Arabic studies, language, and also why anthropology? Sure. Um, no, that that's a fun question. So I I will say my kind of early trajectory felt you know very very haphazard, uh, as a lot of these things turn out. I actually was studying Latin in high school um, and needed to uh, switch languages when I got to Dartmouth because uh, my high school had cut AP Latin, so I you know needed a credit. Um, but Sorry more than interrupt. where did you go to high school? A uh, small town in North Central Massachusetts. Um, okay. Yeah. And so um, one of the many classes that got cut was AP Latin. And um, I had developed, for whatever reason, an interest in the in the Middle East. I took one world religions class in high school that just completely sparked my, my interest. Uh, and I'm, I'm still not sure why. So I uh, was looking for a language, looking for a language that people still speak, <laughs> which led me to, to Arabic and kind of through whatever act of fate I signed up for all the Arabic classes I could sign up for um, and then committed myself to as much study abroad as, as possible um, in after my first year. And I had never been out of the country be before, so um, was just looking to, to, I guess, go anywhere other than, than New England for a stretch. Um, and I feel very, very grateful for those kind of somewhat random decisions at the time because I absolutely fell in love um, with studying the language. And I would say as useful as, as Arabic has been for me in my research and in my career, it was what felt like a very self-indulgent -indul choice at the time. And my, my parents have their own take on, on this as well. But um, I just you know, adored learning the vocabulary, learning the grammar. Um, and that was really my hobby in, in school. Um, and so as I was, was graduating, I um, hadn't quite pinned down what I wanted to do yet and was thinking, well, I should really try and use this language skill I've, I've built up. And, and incidentally, that's what led me to AEI because the uh, internship at the Critical Threats Project where I, where I still am now um, was very in intensive on, on reading um, sources in their, um, in their original language. That really ties back to your, your, your point about anthropology though and, and what drew my interest um, to anthropology. Uh, I mean, initially I went to anthropology as a you know, common theme. I didn't know what I wanted to do and anthro includes 
culture and biology and language and all of these things. I actually started in the biological anthropology track and then switched over. Um, but kind of coming into um, the end of my, my undergrad experience and, and transitioning out from there, I found that kind of the anthropological way of, of thinking and the way of engaging with, with sources added a kind of interesting perspective to the security studies, kind of international relations piece of things. It was a slightly different lens um, that made me, I think, fairly comfortable diving into the open source Intel world and getting really close um, with particularly social media sources and trying to as much as possible, kind of inhabit the the online world. You know, anthropology is based on participant observation, which um, is difficult to do in a you know in a conflict zone. And obviously, there are inherent limitations to um, kind of any study that you're doing from a, a distance. But there's also sometimes useful critical distance. Um, and so I found kind of applying some of the the patterns of thinking that I learned through my anthropology degree towards kind of modern examples and towards um, the source environment and the online environment was pretty enlightening as far as you know a, a way of trying to understand why people were communicating in certain ways what they were trying to say um in in online media so thank you that's very helpful and i'm glad i asked Let, let's go right to content in your area of research uh, when you and i spoke and planned this emily some weeks ago we agreed that the subject of afghanistan is very important and gets a lot of attention and rightfully so as a source past and potentially in the future of terrorism that goes beyond the borders and affects other countries perhaps even the united states but 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 we agreed and it's part of the result of your work that there are other areas of the world deserving of attention including sub-saharan africa um you wrote a piece that i read recently in the Hill at the end of September, maybe September 23rd, that date sticks in my mind, where you try to talk about what you term false assumptions. If we're looking at these networks abroad, what is local, what is regional, but what has the potential to go global? Can you talk to us about the peace the false assumptions, and give us a primer before we start digging into your area of expertise, the things that we need to understand. Sure. Um, this is an interesting part of the, the discussion. So I, I guess I'll, I'll give a little back, a little bit of background on if the ideology of, of some of these groups, because it's actually, it, it's important to understanding how they view their goals. It, tying back into to an anthropology perspective also, a lot of what I'm doing is trying to understand um, the various armed extremist groups in terms of how they see themselves uh, as a, a way of trying to forecast then you know what they might do given you know their resources and given their objectives and so you know the tendency from a U.S. policy perspective is also is often to divide things up very differently and and somewhat understandably you know the last several administrations have looked at jihadist groups and and you know divided them up based on their the immediate threat to our national interest so most obviously is if a group is trying to attack us um, that therefore makes them top priority and that particular piece is not something I'm I'm trying to challenge but rather the idea of kind of chopping up how we see this larger movement based on whether groups are, you know, quote unquote, locally oriented or globally oriented. It's a lot trickier than that because the groups themselves don't recognize that same distinction. Um, and so there's a flow between um, local and global and kind of fundamentally what, what Salafi Jihadi groups want is to, um, basically topple the existing governments across the, the Muslim world, which they also see as, as backed by um, by the West broadly, also Russia, China, other, other players, um, and, and replace those governments with, uh, with the caliphate, um, and then ultimately wage kind of a global apocalyptic war. This is a kind of end times vision that these groups have. Um, now they've gone through various redefinitions over time. One of, you know, kind of Osama bin Laden's big innovations was to go from um, attacking these uh, kind of local Muslim governments directly to saying, okay, that's not working. We need to attack the backer. Um, that means attacking the United States. And there have been kind of various debates throughout the history of this movement where there's where jihadist leaders shift in how they see the strategy. So uh, does it make more sense to focus on um, attacking the local or the near enemy now or the far enemy now? 
Um, and what we've seen within the last decade, especially within the, the Al Qaeda network, has been an intense intentional shift towards um, prioritizing the local, basically the local ground game, um, and trying to actually win over more popular support. That's based on a, a, you know many years of, of lessons learned. Um, and some of the adaptations that we've actually seen in that time are jihadist groups that have tried to remain under the radar by kind of suppressing um, some of their global ambitions or by not talking about it or not by not kind of affiliating um, with that global goal as, as kind of obviously. The Islamic State is kind of a huge burning exception to this, and I can get into the Al Qaeda Islamic State divide uh, if we want to talk about that later. Um, but basically, what we have is is a bunch of jihadist groups that are really focused on kind of establishing local havens and bases and building up capabilities to attack their local rivals. But that um, that's because that's where they've decided to focus now. And some of the capabilities that groups build up locally, whether it's um, you know, bomb making skill or even kind of training a, a leadership cadre that knows how to plan or, or bringing together a network of people who will work together. Those capabilities are equally valuable if they decide they want to plan um, and attack further afield. So there's not kind of a clear bright line between the groups that are going to stay local and the groups that are going to change uh, into a transnational threat. And there are a couple groups over time that have already made that transition. Um, so something I'm working on now is trying to figure out kind of how can we see when a group is going to make that transition in a way that will make them kind of significantly more of a, a global threat uh, rather than what we've seen as a, a local threat. So, so thank you. C could we talk a little bit, uh, we're gonna go back and forth between networks and groups and cooperation and rivalry, but before we go there, um, if I have it right in reading you, in particular in sub-Saharan Africa, I guess there are 40 or 45 or so countries, but you seem to focus, Emily, if I have it right, on three, Somalia, Mali, and Nigeria. Do I have that right? And if so, why focus on these three? Yes. Um, so those three are my main focus. I could throw in a, a few others on the periphery, but basically those are kind of the epicenter countries. If you're looking at jihadist groups, those are the countries that have um, the most established, strongest, most dangerous jihadist groups in them. And they tend to be kind of the hub um, for various spokes that then go out into neighboring countries. So if you look at you know, Al-Shabaab in Somalia, that's the kind of dominant uh, jihadist group in Eastern Africa. There are a bunch of smaller groups and there's been spread um, into Kenya and more recently um, DRC and, and Mozambique have had their own issues. Um, but the kind of more formidable group that has connections to a lot of these, these other groups is in Somalia. Likewise, uh, Mali is kind of the base or the, the primary theater for uh, a whole kind of mishmash of, of jihadist groups um, in the Western Sahel region. They've now spread more into Niger, more into Burkina Faso, but they're kind of fundamentally based in, in Mali. And then many of you will be familiar with Boko Haram in Nigeria. There's now the Islamic State affiliate there. Um, they spill over a couple of different borders in that Lake Chad Basin area, but Northeast Nigeria is really the center um, and, and where, you know, there's a lot of flux as these groups move in and out of different places, but they they have kind of their heartland um, in northeastern Nigeria. So if you're a U.S. policymaker, it seems to me that, that we get wedded to narratives. And so after 9-11, a narrative was that Islamic extremism, terrorism was a principal or primary threat to the United States for our allies. After 20 years and after Iraq and Afghanistan, that seems to be replaced by a narrative. That was a period of overreach or overreaction. Maybe I'm simplifying for effect, but, but the real challenge and threat of the day is great power competition, China, China, China. Now, often the case, it's not simply either or and binary, and it seems to me that one of the values of your work, Emily, is you remind us that we should be able to do two things at once or three or six things at the same time. It's not all one or not all the other. Having said that, how do you advise US policymakers because there is only so much time, political capital, priorities have to be set. We can't be everywhere. So, so when you look at 
your portfolio these critical threats, how do you advise US policymakers to allocate time and resources and focus and set priorities? Sure. Um, no, that's a, a great question. And I get that one a lot. I'd say first on a, a point of framing is I think it, as far as how you, you deal with those priorities, I think that um, you know, the, the big overarching priority that the great power competition piece and the counterterrorism piece fit into is basically kind of maintenance of the, the global order. And I, and there's, I see kind of a cycle or, or reinforcing um, between some of these things. I would still, I would currently put China as a, you know, higher on the list than um, jihadist terrorism to be sure, um, despite my, you know, my, my own research on that front. And um, so I think to a degree, there's, there's truth to the argument that um, you know, we've been kind of stuck putting resources um, towards um, towards one priority when when it would have been useful to pivot earlier to another. But um, I think the the big piece of the debate that gets missed in that in the kind of simplified pivot argument that we all know is simplified, but that's still what you know how we we read our headlines, is that the field of competition um, for great power competition is happening across the Middle East and Africa. I, we don't really want to be competing if we can help it kind of directly on the Chinese border, that would be, you know, that raises the temperature a lot more um, than, than competing elsewhere. I also think there can be a failure of imagination of not just what the worst cases are, but also kind of what, what do we want the world to look like? And so for Africa policy, especially there's, you know, a lot of nice words get thrown after, you know, um, you know, economic growth and development and all of these other pieces that are are part of our, our policy, but um, and, and Africa is now one of the you know fastest growing regions in the world and is going to you know, Nigeria is going to have a larger population than the US by 2050. There's there's a huge amount of growth and potential. And so I think we should be, be more concerned about you know the trajectory of, of large parts of the continent and whether it's going to be generally kind of a, a, a net gain for um, stability and prosperity or, or not. Um, I, you know, on policy recommendations, frankly, I think it's, it's a little bit less of a resource question than an approach question. I mean, we're still spending a lot of money um, in, in a lot of these places. And so I think there, what's actually missing is, is creativity. If you look at kind of the, the current, say the, the security approach in Africa and the development approach in Africa and the diplomatic approach in Africa coming from the US, they tend to be you know, fairly separate channels. And um, what is missing is kind of like a, a gap filling approach um, that actually gets say, you know, development and stabilization aid into the areas that, that need them most. And as it is, um, we've not figured out how to close that gap between right now, the places that only the military can go, but where the military solution is not what's needed. And so I do think there's, this is a tricky thing. And, um, and I think there's, well, at least I feel, that there's you know, a lot of people from different sectors kind of searching for the right policy or the right programming. And so I, I wish I had a, a, a great answer for it, but there is, I think, room for kind of more targeted, not particularly expensive um, kind of approaches that could kind of revamp counterterrorism policy in, in a, a more useful, maybe more preventative direction, um, as opposed to the more reactive approach that we have had, which tends to get expensive over time. Thank you. I'm going to ask one, maybe two more, and then we're going to open it up. So, so then if we stay with Sub-Saharan Africa, um, how does one, how can we be discerning and differentiate? And if you're talking to a member of Congress or a State Department official, and they want to know in country X or even in region, with groups and networks, what's likely to stay local? That's problematic, but but what has a higher a probability of going transnational, maybe reaching the soil of the United States itself or one of our allies? How do you how do you assess probabilities? How do you sort that? Sure. Um, so the way that I sort that is I've kind of got a bunch of factors that I I look for or characteristics um, that a group either has or or that I kind of forecast that it could have under under likely conditions, and so. Um, you know, there, there are a couple of different ways to look at it. One is the, like what the group itself is, is capable of, of doing, you know, how, like how organized are they? How complicated is their planning? Is it really rudimentary or is, is it a little bit more sophisticated? Are they combining, um, 
you know, explosives with tactical teams? Are they like planning operations that have several steps down the road? Sometimes they do that. Sometimes, sometimes it's much more like kind of organic. Um, another question is, are they, how integrated is a group into those kind of global jihadism networks? Um, sometimes they're kind of fairly self-contained or there are just a couple of individuals who say had studied and come back or fought elsewhere and come back. Um, other times there's, you can see like an ongoing media relationship or, you know, foreign fighter influx um, or, you know, various travel or coordination that can mean that a group that had started fairly local is now kind of being integrated and, and can gain capabilities or, and also kind of shift ideologically to a degree by its association with other groups. Um, Another thing to look at is kind of how important is the, the location. Um, and so, yeah, there are some pieces of terrain that are gonna be more valuable and or more dangerous than others. Um, is there a jihadist group kind of taking control of an area that like tends to be a, a major nexus for not just like foreign fighter movement, but also smuggling, trafficking, et cetera. Um, are they gonna make a lot of money sitting there that they could then feed into the network or are they kind of at a subsistence subsistence level? So, you know, in, in that regard, um, there are, you know, say that the, there's now an Islamic State group in, in Northern Mozambique, um, which has been really damaging locally um, and has kind of started to show some some signs of being a little bit more connected regionally, but it's it's in a really remote area. Um, it's not all that connected to the, the kind of Islamic State network yet. It hasn't developed any explosive capability. That's one that I'm not nearly as worried about. The fact that it exists because now we've got the Islamic State in Sub-Saharan, in Southern, in Southern Africa is, is not a great sign, but as far as a transnational threat, it's, it's, you know, really far off from that. Um, whereas if you look at a group like um, Al-Shabaab, which there's been a long running debate over whether it has global goals or local goals. Is it nationalist? Is it jihadist? And it keeps telling us it's jihadist. And, um, and so now everyone's started to kind of believe that, but Al-Shabaab, you know, is making, is pulling in now as about as much revenue as the Somali federal government itself. Um, kind of, it, even if it's not controlling ports directly, it's basically, you know, infiltrated a lot of the the economic activity um they've started trying to send pilots to get training in other countries they've started trying to put bombs on planes like that's a very different animal um than than some of the more remote groups and so the question of you know five years back when you, we could see some of the earlier indicators of shabab heading that direction um that would have been you know maybe a, a useful time to adjust approach and we have been trying to counter shabab for a long time but you, you can see them kind of developing before they get to the point where shabab is now where it's the main african group that has actually demonstrated that transnational attack intent and and initially um some capability okay thank you so so you all i'm going to ask one more before we open it up uh, think about questions and comments. You can put them in chat. You can use the raised hand function coming to you in just a couple minutes or so. My final question at this point, Emily, is the following. Would you give us um, a short list glossary, please? So, so not the list of 30 or 40 terms and groups, but, but the, a half a dozen, give or take, so that we understand what we're talking about. If we see expressions like Salafi, Jihadi, terrorist groups, who are the principal groups or what are the principal points of cooperation or rivalry? Kind of the, like I say, basic glossary, help us with that. Sure. Um, so kind of under the umbrella of, of Salafi Jihadism, um, the two main organizations are Al-Qaeda and the Islamic State. Uh, Islamic State, also known as ISIS, also known as ISIL. There's a whole thing with naming um, that I can give you if you want or can otherwise spare you. Um, and the basic kind of organizational divide across the movement is between Al-Qaeda and the Islamic State and all their various branches and affiliates and associates, groups that are to different to differing degrees connected to kind of those two parent organizations. Um, Al-Qaeda and the Islamic State are rivals um, and basically have, they have the same goal, but different conceptions of the timeline they're on. And that difference means that the top leaders of both groups kind of both think the others are going to hell. And that kind of filters down through the, um, through the networks. Um, one other main piece as, as far as all of the groups that are kind of linked to or associated with Al-Qaeda or the Islamic State, 
those groups tend to form from the bottom up and then affiliate. Um, but there, it can vary, you know, by how much there was uh, influence, say, from Al Qaeda leadership at the beginning, or if it was really a local group that transformed. There, that can get complicated. Um, as far as within Africa, kind of the main groups that we're we're looking at um, are Al Shabaab, which is the Al Qaeda affiliate in in Somalia, um, and then there's a smattering of Islamic State groups also in East Africa, um, and then jumping over to to West Africa, you've got two main areas: um, the Sahel, kind of centered in Mali. There's an Al Qaeda affiliate, um, which has a long acronym that I'll, uh, but we call it JNIM, um, which is also connected to Al Qaeda and the Islamic Maghreb, HIM, which is North and West Africa. There's also an Islamic State group in the Sahel. Um, you've got the Lake Chad Basin in Nigeria, um, which also has an Islamic State group uh, and Boko Haram. Um, and then I haven't really talked about North Africa, which um, my background is in doing a lot of Libya work actually. So um, I'm happy to talk about that too. The, the Salafi Jihadi groups are at a bit of a low ebb um, in North Africa, both on the Islamic State and the Al Qaeda side of things, but um, are still kind of present and, and I expect to still be relevant depending on how um, situation changes there. So I'm, I'm very happy to talk uh, in North Africa as well. So Emily, thank you. So, so we're gonna open it up now. If someone has a question, raise the, uh, press the raise hand function, put your question in chat and if I don't see a hand, Michelle, you'll tell me if I'm missing a hand. And if I don't see a hand, I'd like to call on Patrick Chamrell, who's a member of our editorial board, who is with Stanford in Washington, California. And Patrick, could you talk to us a little bit about the different lenses through which one looks at these problems? Because the United States and Europe stay close together on defense and security matters, however, there are distinctions between, let's say, the United States, France, and Germany in how we focus and emphasize the kinds of threats that Emily is talking about. Could you tell us a little bit about the French debate right now about these threats and how they rank in priority, be it at home in France or through French interests in Africa? Thank you, Jeff, and, and, and thank you, uh, Emily, for uh, your tour d'horizon, if I can use a French expression, uh, for what you've just done uh, brilliantly. Um, I think that uh, obviously the, the question of, uh, of terrorism and the questions of uh, you know, Islamic influence in general is much, of course, greater in Europe uh, than in the United States. And, and is probably greater in France than in the rest of Europe. Um, I think the reasons being that um, uh, there are much larger uh, Muslim populations in Europe, especially in France, which has the, the largest in Europe, uh, that there have been many instances of terrorism, uh, mostly also in France in the last, in the last few years. And, um, and just because Europe is closer to the Middle East and Africa. Um, so, so there is obviously, uh, uh, this issue room very large in domestic politics in, in Europe and, 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 and France, way more than, than in the United States. Uh, I mean, um, so, so that leads to you know, some misunderstanding uh, by Americans about what's going on in Europe, uh, where you see, uh, you know, lots of uh, criticism of uh, the way Europeans treat uh, Muslims, etc. Um, so there's accusation of Islamophobia, etc. Uh, in Europe too, but certainly in the United States, vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, Europe. Um, anyway. Um, Again, my main point is that, you know, the issue in domestic politics is so much bigger in, in Europe than the United States, which of course the United States having had the, the main terrorist attack in, with 9-11, but since then the US has been extremely, extremely uh, safe uh, with a few exceptions. We, and that has not been the case in Europe. So I, I think that, so what 
my, I'd like to ask uh, Emily is, uh, you know, to to what extent you know the these groups have are targeting Europe more than any other regions, including the United States, uh, and is it part of your your, your uh, scope of study uh, to uh, look at the connection between the terrorist organizations and the propaganda tools in general in Africa or the Middle East, uh, but mostly in the countries of Africa, as you, you know well, and 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 Europe. So, are, are there connections between you know Islamist groups in Europe and and in Africa? I guess they are, but how can you characterize them and, and, and how and, and maybe how can you compare them with the United States where I think that you know domestic Islamic group are much weaker but but I'll let you you know tell me tell us about that thank you sure yeah no thank you Patrick and I of course agree with with everything that you laid out there it's a the way that kind of European countries need to kind of rank their priorities um, and how the Islamic extremism piece plays into domestic politics is very is very different. Um, kind of the right the, the closest area of of interest or the biggest area of interest for France. Um, I guess there are two. You have to look at North Africa and you have to look at West Africa, um, kind of across the the former colonies, right? And so um, and this relates to U.S. policy also because U.S. U.S counterterrorism policy in West Africa is essentially to back up the French who have who have the lead in the Sahel. Um, there's actually been a lot going on on this front within the last couple of weeks. Um, one piece is that um, in part because the French mission in the Sahel has not been all that popular domestically, um, you know, including because of some casualties that the French military has taken there, there's um, been a move to you know, draw down or you know, end the current counterterrorism mission and transition to one with more burden sharing, so greater um, presence of other European forces and also um, you know, the, the G5 Sahel Force, which is a regional defense uh, cooperation organization um, that's been set up over the last couple of years. Uh, but there are a couple of, of wrinkles in that. One is that the Malian government has had a coup with well, kind of a coup and a half within the last <laughs> within the, the last year plus, um, which has strained the, the French Malian relationship even further. Um, and um, that has also meant that the Malian junta has been looking to Russia for support. So there there's a you know different overlays of these political dynamics that play out in in Africa. Um, I would say that as far as can connections between the Sahel jihadist groups and Europe, there isn't really much documentation of, of relationships. Those groups are still in a phase where they are predominantly confined to West Africa. The big concern always is that you know jihadist groups will infiltrate refugee flows or migrant flows, and there really isn't evidence to back that up, at least from, from West Africa. Um, that tends to be more fear-mongering, but at the same time, it is a concern because it's something that different jihadist groups, particularly ISIS, have tried to do from other areas in the past, so it's not kind of completely out of the, the realm of possibility. There have been closer ties uh, historically between um, cells and networks inside Europe and North African or Middle Eastern um, jihadist groups, which makes sense based on, on proximity, basically. But a lot of the, um, within the last several years, kind of since the more organized ISIS attacks have faded out. So the most obvious example of that was the, the Paris attack in 2015 that was more coordinated kind of by the Islamic State. Since then, a lot of the kind of the the smaller attacks, like the stabbings and the car rammings and, and those kinds of things, tend to come from um, kind of either first or second generation immigrants of of Middle Eastern and North African origin. Some of whom have kind of traveled back and forth and have more direct connections to jihadist networks in their countries of of origin. So there is kind of an intertwining there. Um, and also sometimes direct planning. So ISIS in Libya was responsible for kind of training up the attacker in the UK, the Manchester, um, the Manchester bombing a few years back. Um, that means also that the circumstances within North African countries are going to continue to matter a lot. Uh, obviously, there's a lot of economic intertwinement and 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 close population ties between, say, France and Algeria or Tunisia, and there's a 
French Algerian spat going on right now, which has led to Algeria closing the airspace to French military flights, which complicates the counterterrorism mission a little bit. Um, and so that will continue to be a factor. I think you know, I'm not an expert in, in French politics by any means, but I do think you know as we move into election periods, like that drives some decision making on foreign policy goals. Um, as far as the nature of French involvement in um, North Africa and in West Africa, though the other piece I would say is I think that the the way that the U.S. withdrawal from Afghanistan went also has an impact. Um, as far as the the French are not looking to to do the exact same thing, um, and now having seen how that that has gone, I think they'll, there will be a real effort to avoid having the same kind of, of, kind of rapid drawdown and, and potential collapse that we've seen in Afghanistan um, in the Sahel. And that was it was never the plan um, for the, the French drawdown to go that quickly. But I think there's probably more caution now, though the wrinkle of the Wagner group, the Russian paramilitary forces showing up makes it a little bit harder to manage that, that transition. Thank you, Amiri. Uh, may, I, may I add the fact that, yes, I think Overall, Europeans, especially the, the French, you know, they consider that the bigger threat to their national security are in that crescent, you know, going from let's say Dakar to to uh, to Dakar, you know, in, in and, and and that's a very, of course, a very large region, uh, more so than even you know Russia or China. I mean, they are of course very serious threat, but I think that. Uh, the priorities between, you know, France, for example, and the United States are quite different, you know, with the United States, obviously China, but uh, France is worried about China too, but, but the key is, is really that, that swath of, of, uh, of, of land, you know, going in Af through Africa, the Middle East and part of Asia. Yeah. Just a, a thought to add on that also, it's so the jihadism piece is a component of this, but the real the real concern it, across that kind of whole massive piece of terrain is the stability of these states generally and whether, you know, if if there are kind of major crises or collapses, where do, where do people go? And so, um, you know, even in, in, I'm looking at some conflicts that don't have a jihad, jihadist component, for example, tracking Ethiopia as one where you know, the kind of refugee outflows have stayed local for now, but depending on where that country trends and it's not looking all that great, you know, what does that mean for, um, you know, are we going to see another refugee crisis? We saw the effect that, say, Syria had on European politics. If, if we've got a bunch of countries across this um, this span that, you know, through some combination of, of political and security crises and also, you know, natural disasters, climate change, um, there's potential for a, a big shift in where people have to be moving and, and going. And that, of course, um, has much more immediate effects on, on Europe than on the, the U.S. Um, I'd argue that it should be a U.S. concern for a whole bunch of reasons, including the stability of Europe and humanitarian reasons generally. But the immediate effect, um, just because of geography, is, of, of course, going to be different um, in terms of levels of urgency. Sure. Thank you. And then there is Turkey. I mean, we don't have time to yeah. talk about this, but Turkey is really... Is a very different uh, outlook on Turkey from the Western European side and the American side. Okay, wait. So, so thank, thank you, you, Patrick. Thank you, Emily. So we're going to turn to Nolia Shosha. Who, who knows now? Because Nolia does European Defense and Security and Black Sea studies. I don't know where Nolia will take us now, but Nolia, if you would introduce yourself, and you have the floor. Sure. Thank you, Jeff, and uh, thank you, Emily, for a fantastic overview. Very interesting. Um, I'm uh, with the Middle East Institute and, and with Georgetown. My question is um, on Afghanistan. You sort of promised both you and Jeff that you're going to talk about it, and um, we, we uh, um, uh, focused a lot on Africa. But um, concretely, what I would be interested in is um, with um, the Taliban coming to power um, in Afghanistan or returning to power, first of all, what kind, what consequences do you see in terms of legitimacy and failed and failing states? You sort of alluded to that um, just, um, just a minute earlier, but also um, uh, you looking at um, Africa as a whole and, uh, and uh, in, in ISIS and Al Qaeda um, over there, where do you see there's been a lot of rumors and, and discussions and um, uh, theories in terms of the, the new governments, uh, the new Taliban government's connections to these two and to um, the African continent. If you can 
give us a bit of an overview of where do you see these ties and where do you see them developing in the next few months to, to a year? That would be one. And then if another um, question, the last one that I have, which is much more broad and conceptual, is if we were to, for a second, abstract great power competition, China, Russia, um, and I know how they trickle into um, uh, ISIS and, and terrorism and, and all of that. But if we were to be able in, you know, in vitro to um, have all the resources um, that we need um, to fight this global phenomenon, global versus local and, and the limited impact, um, but also the, the capabilities that you're looking at, you sort of, um, in real terms, um, focus a lot where they're looking at um, the United States or Europe and particularly France, um, forced by circumstances, are looking a lot at um, uh, uh, deterring or um, containing actually um, and making sure that the effects of, of what they're planning or potential attacks are not as devastating to our resources as, as they can be. If you were to um, advise in, in a vitro situation in which you'd have um, a lot more resources available, um, what would be your approach in terms of looking at instruments to not just contain, but um, how, would, how could we think about um, uh, roots um, of these problems and tackling these roots? if that makes sense. Sure, no, thank you, Yulia. I'll take your second question first. Um, so I, I think the key, the key piece here in, in, not in going beyond deterring these groups is right, we've seen that they tend to keep coming back uh, if conditions don't change. So identifying you know, what the conditions are, I think the one way to think of it is what are the gaps that these groups are, are filling is, yeah, Salafi jihadism has existed for a long time. It's always been on the margins. It's never been popular. It's, it, you know, I don't want to lose sight of the fact that it's an extremely fringe ideology that has the worst effects on the, the people on whom it's imposed. And, um, but there is a dynamic where these groups tend to kind of stick um, in places where there's no better alternative. And so looking at kind of what are they actually bringing to the table that makes them kind of better than, than nothing or uh, and in some cases, right, it's that a population has doesn't have the, the strength to resist them and, and the, the security forces that are present are just as bad. Um, but sometimes it's, these groups have figured out ways to make themselves useful. And so if they're if they are kind of the only security force in place or oftentimes they'll be the only kind of dispute resolution mechanism because there's no other court. Um, sometimes it's as simple as digging wells or, you know, or or that these groups will will like man a checkpoint and won't be as corrupt as, as the alternative. So I do think it'll it'll vary locally, but in, in some cases you can see you know what the risk areas are before there's really a jihadism presence and a really targeted inject of like okay like you know the the you know this state administration isn't able to stand up a court in this place. Can we like microfund that? I think there there's it, you know it would be a huge project to identify this all over the place. But if you started small um, and looked at kind of what's the gap and, and how to fill it, um, I do think there's possibly be there. And local organizations often know that. I think there's there's a gap between you know, NGOs oftentimes, and there's some challenges with um, where particularly kind of the big NGOs are able to operate versus sometimes um, kind of different um, and, and smaller groups. And so I would throw uh, I would start trying to be more creative about where that funding could go and, and seeing kind of what the, the small wins could be that, that you could build on. Uh, because it's it's not a military fight. I mean, everyone's already said this and we've been doing this for, for a long time, but um, you know, the, the kind of doing, you know, the mowing the grass forever, doing keeping up the drone strikes. It's not that there's no point for, there's no point to trying to um, kind of suppress that, you know, remove that top level of, of leadership, but we've seen over time that that's, that doesn't really work unless it's just as a group is starting out and, and while that one first leader is still really important. So um, really shifting focus to the governance aspect would be would be key in the ability to try and deliver improved governance in areas that aren't secure, which is why it's difficult. So, you know, some cool work that you see is in the realm of like sending former uh, military folks who have the training to protect themselves out to do development work, like that kind of merging um, because of the, the difficulty of sending um, you know, diplomats or, or aid workers sometimes into these situations. Break to, to answer your, your first question then um, to think about Afghanistan. So, right. So 
from the perspective of, of Salafi jihadi groups, this is absolutely huge. I mean, some of the rhetoric that's come out is, you know, talking about this is an event on the scale of 9-11 as far as how these groups need to kind of see it and try and internalize it. So we're still in a phase of where like, you know, the chief Al Qaeda guys, the chief ISIS guys are still trying to figure out like, what this means and what lessons to take away from it. Some of the Al Qaeda groups are already starting to kind of promote this as like, hey, our strategy was was working in that basically playing the long game uh, was working, whereas ISIS tried to kind of move things up and they went ahead and declared the caliphate. Um, we're now seeing that that was, you know, probably too quick. Um, and so the Al Qaeda groups that have been pursuing the longer kind of more under the radar approach, um, more willingness to negotiate um, are maybe seeing success. A lot will depend on how like Taliban governing goes and whether um, whether jihadist groups read it as acceptable or not. So for now, um, ISIS guys have decided that they hate it um, and that the Taliban government has become apostate and they're doing things wrong. So that's why you're seeing you're seeing the, the Taliban and ISIS fighting within Afghanistan, but also kind of the rhetorical response from the ISIS network has been negative. Um, the Al Qaeda side of things is a little bit more mixed. Um, and there's some have there's a, basically a wait and see, wait and see element. Um, the outcome that I think is is dangerous and that I'm starting to see coming through in some of the African groups is that um, they're, they're seeing the Taliban's victory as, you know, inspirational, basically, and a sign that, you know, after all this time, you know, the West finally is retreating, this might be the time to really push hard on the local governments and see if, if um, this time, um, there won't be a strong, a strong backlash. Um, and so, um, you know, one of the, the reasons for the way that we had framed this talk actually was that, you know, we get, there's a lot of discussion right now about the you know, Islamic Emirate of, of Afghanistan and, and the Taliban declaring um, that government, but there are a bunch of other groups that have that same goal and that even if they don't declare them in name, you know, there's essentially an Al-Shabaab Emirate forming in Somalia, there's, um, you know, the, the Al-Qaeda group in Mali is doing the same thing and is trying to negotiate for kind of that same end. And so we could be moving into a world where we see a, a bunch of, uh, you know, or well, not a bunch, a handful maybe of these kinds of statelets, probably not all reaching the level of potential international recognition like the Taliban will. Um, and so what example did that, does then that set um, for, you know, resistance movements and armed groups in a lot of different places across the Muslim world. It's kind of proof of concept for an alternative approach to democracy. It's a, you know, um, and one that we would, would um, from a U.S. perspective, is not <laughs> necessarily the kinds of, of partners we'd want to be uh, needing to deal with or additional antagonists that we would, would need to have. Um, so I do think the next year or so will be, will be critical because we could, it, it, it will depend on how jihadist groups actually read the results of what's happened. And I think that's still going on. Um, and so there, there are a couple different outcomes we could see, but at least up until now, the general take has been that like, this is a great thing um, for jihadist groups. And as long as the Taliban doesn't screw it up, they're gonna take it as a, as a victory, uh, at least on the kind of the Al Qaeda side of things, which has been more ascendant lately. So uh, Emily and Yulia, thank you very much. I'm gonna call on Fritz and I'm also gonna note that we're nine and a half minutes to go. Emily, we also have a question in chat by a colleague who would like to hear from you about the Palestinian piece of this puzzle. Is it local? Is it related? If you could sort that a little bit. So that when you wish and Fritz, you have the floor. All right, this, this very interesting discussion, especially what you read, what you're seeing in chat or that type of thing. And um, I'd like to explore that a little more. I have little mini questions. And you know, it's interesting because you have discussions of strategy and tactics and things like this. But much of, since we're talking about a number of groups and there's gonna be competition for, um, for troops, so to speak, or, or fighters for money, um, and then the ideology they put forward to, to attract people. And so I'm curious, here are a couple of real quick things that came to mind. And are you seeing significant differences? Are groups trying different strategies and different approaches and to criminal activity, using criminal activity as a source of revenue and finance? Because I would have to think that that tarnishes in some cases, or some groups would say it tarnishes our ideology or tarnishes our approach. Uh, so criminal activity is one. Um, the other is how much distinction are you maybe seeing in discussions of targeting the US versus Europe? 
and that being the near war and the far war. And, and are you seeing a lot of groups trying to position themselves vis-a-vis -vis each other on near far or, or US Europe? Um, and then I'm, I'm curious, this is a really minor little point, but are you seeing, is there any discussion out there about United States administrations, the Biden administration versus the Trump or something like that? Do, do, does, do they get into that kind of detail or is that just that? <laughs> Don't worry about it. And last and not least, the fourth is crypto because cryptocurrency would seem to be an obviously a very great tool and I'm curious, is that something that uh, all of a sudden, is, is there, or do they discuss that a lot as, as part of the financial aspect? All right, thank you. So Fritz, sure. I said we have nine minutes left and you heard 29 minutes. No, no, <laughs> tiny answer. These, these, these aren't, you just- I can, I can, I can try and pull them together. I can try and pull them together. I'm um, teasing and it's a lot of rich, <laughs> it's rich territory. So thank you, Fritz, over to you, Emily. Sure. Um, yeah, I think I can pull this together actually in how these groups both see themselves and how they are, are trying to present themselves. Um, and I'd say first recognizing there's there's obviously kind of a deep hypocrisy at the heart of this ideology and how these groups function because they are criminal organizations, but they're also trying to present themselves as, as pure in various ways. And so um, as in the trajectory of some of these groups, that's a tension that you see where the, when they kind of first start to come to power, they can they can say that more credibly because they can actually be or at least seem less corrupt um, than some of these governments that are in place, whether it's national or local, um, remembering that the bar is extremely low um, for these groups and the and the use of religion um, can they, they use that for for credibility. And it's kind of a it can be a, you know, a one eyed man leading the blind situation where if they they have someone who can claim religious expertise um in a context where there isn't much then then it can go pretty far even if when confronted with with much greater credentials and it kind of falls apart i would say you know, just a few examples on criminal activity so um you know al shabab is one where um basically they're trying to convince people to continue to live under al shabab in a lot of cases and most in most of the time people do in part because they don't because uprooting and moving to another part of the country is, is difficult, but also, um, you know, say people transporting goods will choose to go through Al-Shabaab territory rather than through Somali government territory, because in Al-Shabaab territory, they'll give you a receipt at the checkpoint so you don't, don't get taxed multiple times, but if you're going through the Somali government territory, it's a bunch of different militias and you have to pay over and over again. So sometimes it's basic administration. We saw this with the, the sheer level of bureaucracy that ISIS attempted to build, um, is that sometimes they're actually trying to deliver value there. Um, at the same time though, that, right, to get after that hypocrisy, you then got people fleeing Al-Shabaab areas because they're trying to recruit child soldiers. Like th there's there's some places where they can try and fill a gap, but then they usually overstep. And so the, the changes in strategy that we've seen from some of these groups have been kind of a negotiation with themselves over if they've stepped too far. And then you see ISIS itself being basically like, there is no too far to step. And so they kind of go for everything at, at once. So you see these different strategic approaches. Um, you also see, you know, to, to the point about trying to counter corruption, some of the courts that these groups have formed, say in Mali, they'll sometimes make, like they'll agree with like an official state ruling on something or like a local, another local official ruling to, to make sure they look impartial. Like they, they don't, sometimes they, they give like real and useful rulings when it's on like local commerce and stuff that, that doesn't really get after the ideology. So that's a, a service that can be useful. As far as how the competing groups try and distinguish um, you know, between each other, so they are competing for recruits. They're also competing for public perception. Um, and so one of the interesting dynamics we've seen in all of these areas that have like an Al-Qaeda presence and an ISIS presence is the Al-Qaeda groups trying to present themselves as moderate compared to ISIS, the extremist, which is of course kind of wild to think about because they're all very extreme, but that's actual language they use. Um, and so drawing those distinctions and the presence of a more, a more extreme or more violent group making another group look more reasonable. We also see this in Nigeria where in this case it was Boko Haram that was kind of its own animal. It wasn't affiliated with Al Qaeda because the old leader was honestly too crazy for Al Qaeda to wanna deal with him, which is a pretty high bar. Um, and so the, in this case, the Islamic State group came in as more moderate because they weren't doing as many attacks targeting Muslim civilians um, and using forced 
female child suicide bombers like Boko Haram was, which is a bridge too far even for, for ISIS, which is saying something. And so you see it more, less so in how they talk about targeting outwards, but more in how they talk about dealing with civilians and with other Muslims. So, you know, ISIS more likely to target Shia that came out of the Al Qaeda in Iraq tradition, the rest of Al Qaeda more likely to um, save that fight for another day basically. And so how they kind of rack and sack those priorities in different local contexts can distinguish them from each other. They talk about the U.S. and Europe similarly, though. There's not, um, you know, that tends to get lumped together as the West and the Crusaders. It's not, there's not a, a huge amount of, of granularity there. Um, that said, in some of the propaganda, they, they will very much get into the political dynamics. And one interesting thread that um, in, in some of the jihadist propaganda over the last couple of years has been trying to pick up on kind of evidence of social strife in the US as proof positive that you know the Western model doesn't work. And so picking up on language from like racial dynamics in the states or various like you know political issues that have been going on, you see it kind of refracted through through propaganda. Um, I would say that there's I mean, there's plenty of general media that's non-jihadist around the world that's also picking up on those things and, and calling out some of the problems um, with what's going on in the U.S. at home versus the, the image abroad. So I, I wouldn't say that it's like super, it's particularly impactful when the jihadists do it, but they, they do do it. Um, and then let's see. So on, on the point of, of crypto, I, there is some, I, I, it's kind of within the the like general jihadist chatter um, as far as like looking for ways to, to function online and so the online space, as far as the public online space has gotten a lot more difficult for jihadists to operate in since 2015 so that, you know, kicked off of a lot of platforms, which is good. It makes it harder to track them as an open source researcher, but yeah, good um, generally. And so, um, but I do think that the, you know, the internet's going to be um, where a lot of these groups continue to live. I've been arguing up to this point that a physical haven is still necessary for a lot, a lot of the capabilities that they have, but I'm also watching for when that, I think there's going to be a tipping point when that changes. I'm just not quite sure what it looks like yet. And, and the other big question there is kind of what are the capabilities that you might see, you know, I would worry about, um, you know, kind of a jihadist or hacking nexus. Like I, I think we, we get stuck thinking about the attacks that have happened in the past and we need to be thinking about kind of not just Salafi jihadis, but right, all of the other different kinds of, of extreme groups that you could have um, that could start to use other, you know, other means. And so, you know, what is the ransomware gonna look like in the future? What's hacking gonna look like? These groups have adopted drones pretty handily in, in various cases. And so there's a willingness to pick up new technology. The um, kind of fundamentalism of the ideology does not apply to weapons tech They're, and communications. They're very happy to, to pick up um, and run into the future with that kind of, of stuff. Oh, and and I'll, I'll make a brief note on, on Palestine and nowhere out of time, but um, there's an interesting thing here where the, the Palestinian issue still really resonates with Muslim populations broadly, um, but Arab governments right, don't, don't talk about it, especially in a post-Abraham Accords world, right? That dynamic has really shifted. The jihadists talk about this all the time. Um, and are one of the main things that some of the Al-Qaeda groups still talk about is they're hammering on the, the Trump administration's embassy move from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem constantly. I had practically forgotten that, that happened. They talk about it all the time. So there is a, a kind of carrying the flag for that cause um, that these groups do do. And, and they've found, at least they've um, written in some of their own stuff that they found that it tends to resonate, especially when Muslim governments are seen as having abandoned fellow Muslims. So there's an interesting question there of what that will mean with regard to China and the Uyghurs um, in the future as well. To end on a cliffhanger. <laughs> so, so, so Fritz and Emily, thank you very much. Thank you everybody for your valuable time. Uh, read Emily Estelle in places like the Wall Street Journal, the LA Times, the Hill. Uh, look into the work she's doing to the Critical Threats Project at American Enterprise Institute in Washington. Emily, we're grateful. That was very interesting. You helped widen our lens in a number of ways. And then let us have you back because I know in 2022, you have some travel planned to some of the countries and regions under question. So, so we wish you safe travel when you get there, but we would love to have you back in a couple or so months.
Yeah, no, thank you. This was fun. Great, great questions. And I would love to come back. Um, thank you for having me and, and feel free to reach out or, or Jeff, if you want to share my contact info, I, that's fine. I'm, I'm happy to be in touch with, with anybody um, on the call and, and looking forward to joining you guys again in the future. Terrific. Thank you, everybody. Emily, thank you so much. Very useful for us. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great thank day. You.